Our exhortation this morning is going to be provided by Brother Jacob Larson. And the title for his talk is, What Phase Are You In? And to prepare for his comments, he's asked that we read Psalm 37. So I'm going to read it. We're going to re be reading from the NIV. Psalm 37, beginning in, in verse 1. Do not fret because of evil men, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when men succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. For evil men will be cut off but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy great peace. The wicked plot against the righteous and gnash their teeth at them. But the Lord laughs at the wicked for he knows their day is coming. The wicked draw the sword and bend the bow to bring down the poor and the needy slay those whose ways are upright but their swords will pierce their own hearts and their bows will be broken better the little that the righteous have than the wealth of many wicked for the power of the wicked will be broken but the lord upholds the righteous the days of the blameless are known to the lord and their inheritance will endure forever in times of disaster they will not wither in days of famine they will enjoy plenty. But the wicked will perish. The Lord's enemies will be like the beauty of the fields. They will vanish, vanish like smoke. The wicked borrow and do not repay, but the righteous give generously. Those the Lord blesses will inherit the land, but those he curses will be cut off. If the Lord delights in a man's way, he makes his steps firm. Though he stumble, he will not fall. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. I was young and now I am old, yet I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging for bread. They are always generous and lend freely. Their children will be blessed. Return from evil and do good. Then you will dwell in the land forever. For the Lord loves the just and will not forsake his faithful ones. They will be protected forever, but the offspring of the wicked will be cut off. The righteous will inherit the land and dwell in it forever. The mouth of the righteous man utters wisdom, and his tongue speaks what is just. The law of God is in his heart. His feet do not slip. The wicked lie in wait for the righteous, seeking their very lives. But the Lord will not leave them in their power, or let them be condemned when brought to trial. Wait for the Lord and keep his way. He will exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you will see it. I have seen a wicked and ruthless man flourishing like a green tree in its native soil. But he soon passed away and was no more. Though I looked for him, he could not be found. Consider the blameless. Observe the upright. There is a future for the man of peace. But all sinners will be destroyed. The future of the wicked will be cut off. The salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. So reads Psalm 37. Now, turn our attention over to Brother Jacob for his subject. What phase are you in?
Well, good morning, everyone. Great to see you all. Um, just to give you an understanding, this is not my first exhortation, but this is the first one I've given here, and it's uh, great to be with you all. Um, so I've noticed that in my, during the times I've given exhortations, I tend to look for something that I can apply to myself, something that is applicable to everyone else, that is something I can implement in my walk as a fellow servant of Christ. And this is especially something that has resulted in me coming back and forth to the idea of what type of light am I? What type of light am I personifying uh, to the world? And part of this comes from the background that I have as being a uh, predominantly public school, private school at home from seventh grade, where I went from that uh, very, I wouldn't say sheltered, but more uh, protected environment to going into the trades as an electrician apprentice, a very uh, sharp change from one to the other. And so for me, it's always something that I am trying to think of. Am I truly being a light of Christ? Am I showing uh, Christ's light? And it resulted in when I gave my first or second exhortation talking about it in relation to a light bulb. As, am I being a light bulb of, uh, for God's light? And now I'm going a little away from the electrician side and more focused on now the uh, natural side uh, that God has provided. Now, the reason I bring this all up is when I was down in Texas Bible School this summer, I met a wonderful brother named Joey Rodriguez uh, at High Bible School. And has that, anyone ever noticed that it's typically the last night that you have some of the best conversations with your brothers and sisters, and you're like, why couldn't I have had this previously? What, what, what is so special about this last night? And we talked all over the spectrum, um, and eventually we talked about the idea of looking at the moon as being a reflection of Christ's life and us being the moon, and talking a little bit about that. And uh, that sparked my interest in thinking about what else, what other aspects from the moon can we take in our everyday life and looking at how we are? So, so this analogy is twofold. There will be some aspects that are going to be covered uh, in general by the moon, and there will be other ones that are more specific to the earth. Um, and so to help us make certain that we are all on the same page of some of the words that will be used, um, when I say the world, I'm, I'm going to be talking about the moral definition of the world. It is those who practice immorality are not part of Christ's flock and who practices those that are the practices that entice us to be like the world. Um, and when I talk about the land and later on, we're going to be talking about the kingdom of God on earth, which we kind of got to see being mentioned in Psalms 37. Uh, and the sea, I will also be mentioning that is in relation to the multitude of nations and the wicked, which we can kind of see in Isaiah 57 and 17. And of course, the sun being Jesus and the light that he provides. I just for kicks and giggles decided to look up with how many times Jesus is referred to the light. It was mind boggling. I've only done a couple just to help us refresh our minds about just how much of a light and how bright of a light Jesus will be. So if we can turn over to Isaiah 60, verses 19 through 22, uh, we'll get a bit of an understanding of just the amount of light that he will be outputting. So in Isaiah 60, verse 19 to 22, we are talking about uh, the blessing that will be given to uh, the Gentiles. And uh, it's in particular about the land and what the light will be. So the sun shall no longer be your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give light to you. But the Lord will be to you an everlasting light and your God, your glory. Your sun shall no longer go down, nor shall your moon withdraw itself. For the Lord will be your everlasting light and the days of your morning shall be ended. Also, your people shall be righteous they shall inherit the land forever the branch of my planting the work of my planting the work of my hands 
that I may be glorified. A little one shall become a thousand, and a small one, and a strong nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in this time. And going over to Isaiah 42, 6 through 7, we also read, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness, and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, and to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. What a wonderful reference we have of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and what he will do for us. For we are the Gentiles that it talks about. We are part of that family. So just so that we don't see it just in the Old Testament, well, let's go over to John. Uh, we'll have two references that I want to pull out, uh, starting in chapter 8 and verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And John 12, 35, 36, we read. Then Jesus said to them, a little while longer, the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. And he who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. That's our calling. We've been called to become sons of light. And we no longer have Jesus walking with us in this mortal age where we can actually see him. But we still have his lessons, his uh, morals, his values, and his views that we get to read every day from the scriptures. So now moving on to the moon, I would say the moon is those who reflect the light of Jesus or God. And one of the biggest examples of someone who was called to be a light, to be a reflection, is John the Baptist. That was his sole purpose. He was to be the light, to light the way for Jesus. And um, in Titus 2, verses 11 through 12, we read, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and to worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. And furthermore, in 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 6, we read, Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man conscious in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose mind the God of this age has blinded. Do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So that is our call. That is what we are then commanded to do. So, uh, the moon phases, that, that was the biggest thing that came up in our, in our conversation, the fact that there are different phases of moons, and the, each of them has a different spiritual uh, aspect. So, I would say, uh, I would like you all to notice something. Notice this little inner moon right there. Half of it is always covered in light, the other half is always covered in dark. Every day, no matter what phase we are in, we always have Jesus with us. He is always there shining his light. We get to choose whether or not we will reflect none of it, a quarter of it, all of it, or maybe somewhere in the middle as life goes. So that is something that we need to keep in mind is that no matter where we are, no matter what struggle we're going through, Jesus is always there. God is always there if we are to look for them. Now, the new moon, I've noticed, seems to have two different phases or two different aspects um, that we can apply to us. One being the aspect of it being a complete rejecting of uh, God. The other one is a recharging moment. There are times where we might need to just step back from the world, get a little opportunity to recharge. We see Jesus doing that many times when he goes off into the wilderness to pray. The disciples also followed suit. And even Elijah, when he went to Mount Sinai, 
he also went off. Now, the complete rejecting of God and becoming like the world is the aspect that I'm going to be focusing more on in this uh, exhortation. And we see that in how Ahab completely disregards God or Solomon during the period of his life. Also, I would say the children of Israel during the time of the judges is a great example. And even the scribes and Pharisees in relation to Jesus. I would like you all to keep that in mind when uh, we get to another aspect of the moon. Now, the half moon, the first quarter and the last quarter. Interesting thing, you can go either way. But the also aspect about it is it is a this aspect of wishy-washiness, apathetic, um, lukewarm. And when you think about it in that way, you think about the later C in church and what they are condemned for is that they are lukewarm. They are one way or the other. And that's something that we don't want to be as, as Christians. We do not want to be lukewarm, only showing half the light. We want to be, hopefully, in one of these categories. But uh, it is something that we need to be careful of uh, because we have that opportunity to either go from a crescent or from the half moon to the crescent or to the gibbous. Now, talking about the crescent and gibbous, that's where I believe most of us are. We are mostly, as a majority, in that thing. We are either showing a little bit of light, showing a lot of light. It all depends on where we are at that time spiritually. Uh, I would say right now, I personally am probably in this phase. I wish I was closer to this phase, but I am uh, not there yet. And that's what I'm, I'm trying to reach this phase. I hope to one day. Now, the... The aspect of the gibbous and the crescent is it is something that shows up on both sides. The, the only the difference between them is whether or not they're waxing or they're waning. And we need to be careful which one we are in. We need to realize which side we are. We need to realize if we are waxing or if we are waning, if we are growing or if we are shrinking. If we are, we need to do a course adjustment. That's a nice thing about us in regards to the moon we can actually jump over to the other side of the earth and not have to be continuing on with the cycle. Now, the full moon phase, I would say is the complete visual representation of God and Christ's life. And the only one I believe has ever fully reached that phase and shown it for all his life is Jesus. No one else, I think, has ever fully lived his life in that manner where they fully reflected the light and light of God. I believe many times in our lives, there will be a small portion of our life where we reach that point, but something will end up happening that will throw us off. Um, so outside of the phases, what is another big thing that you guys think of when you think of the moon? Uh, there's something that is typically uh, attributed to uh, the signs. Yes. Brother Joseph said the eclipse. So there are two eclipses that occur, the lunar eclipse and the solar eclipse. Now, there is, I think, a, a powerful parallel that we can make to those, to our lives and our uh, spiritual walk. So a lunar eclipse, in case anyone has forgotten, I, I know I kind of actually forgot since science class, uh, was when Earth stands, the lunar eclipse occurs when the Earth stands between the sun and the moon. And that is only occurs when there is a full moon. And then that aspect, we need to think about, are we going to allow the earth, the temptations of the world to prevent ourselves from being a shining light? That, that is the ultimate call and the warning of the lunar eclipse in this uh, analogy is that we don't want to allow that to happen. And we need to be mindful that that will happen and how to prevent that. Uh, and some of the things that can distract us is found in First John 2, verses 15 through 16, where it talks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, all being from the world. And that's something that we need to be careful of and mindful of, that we don't let those sha shadow and uh, cloud our uh, light and reflection. 
Now the solar eclipse is when the moon stands between the sun and the earth. And that occurs when we are going through a new moon phase. And that, that is something that is equally just as uh, detrimental to the people on the world because uh, it, it, it is, we are blocking the light. We're no longer allowing the light of the sun to shine through. There's sure, sure there's a small little ray that goes around, but that's about it. Uh, and, and that's something that we want to be careful that we don't put ourselves in that position where we prevent the light of Christ, the light of God to reach the people, to reach the world. Uh, and we see those through scripture, the people who did that was the Pharisees or Jeroboam. They prevented the light of God from reaching the children of Israel. And that's something that we don't want to do with the world and the flock that can be. So now stepping away from the phases, let's look a little bit into the effects that the moon has on the actual uh, earth and how it can uh, affect little aspects. Um, the biggest one that we all know about is in the aspects of the water, the tides. That is the biggest thing that most people know the moon affects. There is also, it affects the axis, the tilt of the earth, and the speed and distance uh, between the earth and the moon. So in relation to the water, there is another aspect that I had never heard of until I was compiling my notes. And that is, it also helps minutely with evaporation. Now, Evaporation is when the water is uh, heated up to the point where it becomes a gas and goes up into the air and then falls later on uh, onto the land, hopefully. And that is something that I want to point out is that when we look at the aspect of the water, the sea of nations going on to the land, kingdom of God, we are just a small aspect. We're very minutely involved, but we are involved nonetheless. And it, we are trying to, by being the full reflection, bring about the uh, people of the world coming to God. And that, that, that is, uh, was an interesting note for me, especially since the level of light that we shine is proportionate with the amount of uh, heat that is reflected as well. And in 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 11, we read, Who then is Paul? who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believe, as the Lord gave to each one. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each one will receive his own reward, according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God, which are, was given to me as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. We are not. We cannot produce our own light. We can only reflect what God and Jesus has given us and watch and pray for the effect it will cause on the world. Now, it is believed that the moon helps stabilize the earth uh, or the world by keeping its axis consistent. They believe, scientists believe that without the moon's involvement, the earth's axis would be all over the place and we would no longer have a consistent season uh, and it would mess things up. And th that can also be applied in the spiritual aspect because we act as a somewhat of a moral compass for the world. We act with the Judeo-Christian views and what we have received from the Bible as a means to help keep the world on a more or less spiritual track. Um, but just as much as we are trying to be involved in that, there is also the aspect that we are progressively growing further and further apart caused by um, the there, there's a technical term. I forgot to include it in my notes. Uh, there's a technical term where the boon uh, acts almost as an anchor, slowing down the world and thus speeding up the moon and getting, allowing it to get further and further away from the earth. Uh, and that natural occurrence is very similar to how the world is progressively getting further and further away from us. The views that we have and the views of the world have changed drastically, even the short 20 years of my 
20 some years of my life. And it, it just astounds me how far we, apart we have become. Uh, and gives me the hope and realization that uh, the kingdom of God may not be that much further because as the moon gets further and further away, the days get progressively longer. And that will kind of point towards the idea of when eventually it will be a full 24 hour day of light, which will appear when Christ is reigning and God also reigns as well. So what a wonderful thing we have to look forward to. And as we remember and take partake of these emblems, I would like to close by rereading a portion of Psalms 37 to remind us why we must pers persevere and continue to reflect the light of the sun. So starting back into Psalm 37, verse one through 11. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourselves also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because the man who brings wicked schemes to pass cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only causes harm, for evildoers shall be cut off. But those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, we look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace caused by evil desires. Thank you.